Good afternoon and thank you so much for joining us here at the Progressive Business Forum as we discuss the open document on economic recovery. Allow me now to acknowledge and welcome Minister Mamuloko Kubai Ngobane, who is the member of the ANC Subcommittee on Economic Transformation, where the General Manager of the ANC, Comrade Phoebe Potchitter. Trudy Makaya is the Economic Advisor to the President of the Republic of South Africa. We have Dr. Smongile Vilagazi, who's an academic and business strategist. Gina Skuman is with the Citibank uh, Global and our most gracious host, the convener of the Progressive Business Forum, Sasha Miller, who will do an introduction and talk through the logistics. So just as a, a form of introduction and giving you context. Again, we welcome your audience and thank you for joining us on live streaming on Facebook. So this is the ANC Progressive Business Forum virtual streaming and open conversation on the importance of women in economic recovery in the context of the discussion document of the ANC Subcommittee on Economic Transformation. It's entitled Reconstruction, Growth and Transformation building a new inclusive economy. And this is a public online uh, platform. You're welcome to invite uh, business formations and communities that want to engage on this working document. And it is the second part uh, of this conversation that we're having as part of the economic recovery plan. But uh, we are still on level two, so we're observing social distancing as part of the healthcare protocols. And uh, as mentioned, follow us on social media platforms. It, it's, it's at ANCPBF, and the recording will also be made available on request. And again, a warm welcome. My name is Cindy Mabi, which uh, I'm the founder of Cindy Mabi Network, which is a um, digital content hub. But in my previous incarnation or lifetime, um, I was a senior anchor with the Afro Worldview, also SABC Weekend Live and ETV Sunrise. So I know how to run the online content hub because I had been there when the pockets of excellence had existed and where uh, in some parts things had gone horribly wrong. So with those words, I'd like to also just reflect on the panelists that we have. We have a diverse, dynamic, uh, esteemed speakers who are experts in their respective fields. So without any further ado, allow me to introduce our convener for the Progressive Business Forum, and that's Sasha Miller. It's over to you, Sasha. Thank you so much, Cindy. It's such an honor to welcome you this afternoon and what a lineup we have today. But of course, it's very a particular welcome to the participants, participants here today as well. All women webinar with such a powerhouse. Thank you for your kind presence. And we look forward to a valuable and important engagement regarding the importance of women in economic recovery. Let me give you a little bit of background. For those of you attending for the first time, it's important for you to have a context of these webinars. The ANC Progressive Business Forum, or PBF, under the leadership of the ANC Treasurer General, has been mandated to obtain inputs into the discussion document prepared by the ANC's Subcommittee on Economic Transformation, entitled Reconstruction, Growth and Transformation, Building a New Inclusive Economy. And if you haven't read it yet, please do. You can find the link on our website. The document, in essence, identifies key sectors of the economy requiring attention and proposing interventions to stimulate and add impetuous, impetus sorry, to these sectors. In the space of a very short time span, the PBF has embarked on an ambitious plan to engage on the new economy. And this one has involved several phases. The first phase, the PBF hosted a webinar on the 17th of August with the Treasurer General, Paul Mashatele, the Chair of the ANC Subcommittee on Economic Transformation, Mr. Enoch Kodongwane, uh, Dr. Kosinetso Ramachopa, Head of Investment Infrastructure Unit of the Presidency, Mr. Martin Kingston, Chairman of uh, Business for South Africa, Mr. Cass Kuvadi, CEO of Business Unity South Africa, and Mr. Sandile Zungo, President of the Black Business Council. We also then engaged on a second phase for businesses to, in a written submission, uh, send remarks, and we've actually created a report of that. This third phase, fundamental to the very heart of the economy, is the power of women in South Africa. 
And for that reason, we are devoting an entire webinar to women in business and in government to explore and engage the importance of women in economic recovery. We look forward to hearing from our speakers and the panelists and from you today. From, the perspective, from this perspective, since I took over as convener of the PBF, this was in October last year, it has been important for us to reconfigure, if you will, the very way things were done. As a subscription-based organization, it, it is an imperative to communicate effectively and efficiently with our subscribers. They are at the very heart of the PBF after all. And from the outset, it has been my commitment and determination for the PBF to be accountable, transparent, and measurable in its undertakings, both with subscribers, but also in between the tripartite of, of businesses, government, and the party. The PBF, with its focus of empowering SMMEs, runs several programs in terms of its mandate, including ministerial briefings, research and roundtable discussions, business summits, skills training development workshops, trade exhibitions, trade facilitations, and progressive women in business summits, um, and like this forum today. This is by no means a small agenda by any standards. And in a very short period, we set out about modernizing the PBF systems and utilizing all sorts of communications platforms afforded by modern technology to reach out to our subscribers and to fulfill this mandate. Then came the challenge of the post COVID-19, presenting an unprecedented changes for the PBF. There was no file or document we could refer to on how to continue to run the subscription based organization, which historically conducted all our programs face to face only. All our programs had to be now be conducted virtually, like today's on Zoom, and still meet the mandate and the undertakings of the PBF. I'm thrilled to say that the PBF today continues to refine these systems, communications and practices by being accountant, uh, accountable, transparent, and measurable in our undertakings. And I can say, as the first ever woman of PBF convener, there's been occasions when the changes and re-gearing of the PBF that I've presided over has honestly co caused me to doubt and wonder if they would at all deliver what I'd hoped or had intended. And I'd be dishonest of me if I didn't admit that sometimes I didn't feel that I could do the task. However, as the months have passed by, it's been confirmed to me and to those who work with us over and over again that taking bold steps and willingness to explore beyond the confines of safety and predictability is the way ahead. I don't often like using cliches and getting out of your comfort zone, but in reality, the fruits are being born from doing just that. And that's been exactly what's had been required to deliver valuable returns to our PBF subscribers. And perhaps we can take something from that for today's conversation. Let's move beyond our comfort zone and really engage because it takes that little bit of uncomfortability for us to move forward and to really get that inclusive uh, economy that we're really wanting. The majority of our staff at the PBF are also women and almost all mothers and children. They have been empowered and believe in themselves and grow stronger every day. And I'm very honored to be able to say that. I'm also privileged to be, as the convener of the PBF and a woman, to lead this organization, to preside over the re-gearing and reconfiguration, and to be part of the ANC, an organization and leadership of officials who understand that change can best be affected by doing what is not always comfortable or safe. And this is this I have had and still have the fortune to work with the Treasurer General of the ANC, Mr. Paul Maschettelli. He's been the embodiment of the observation made by the entrepreneur and former journalist, Rita Zahara, who said, one of the greatest things you can do to help others is not just to share what you have, but to help them discover what they have within themselves, to help themselves. 
In my experience, the empowerment of women in no way excludes the role of men. The opportunity exists equally for men in business to provide those platforms as a springboard for women to become more empowered. In providing those opportunities, men promote the future stability, growth, and development of our country. This is a collaborative effort with far-reaching and positive consequences for South Africa. We thank you for your kind participation today as you bring your gravitas to this important task, addressing our economy. I'm reminded of the words, perhaps one of those most recent female activists, the Australian born Gina Dunn, who put it so well in an essay in 2013. Feminism isn't about making a woman stronger. Women are already strong. It's about changing the way the world perceives that strength. This is what today is all about. I encourage you to make this opportunity worthwhile and to turn thoughts and ideals into reality. In closing, we are encouraged to participate, participate actively in webinars, such as today's, reminded by the words of the first woman to head IBM, Jenny Romerty, who said, your value will not, is not what you know, it is what you share. We look forward to be able to share this today. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Convener, for your opening remarks. And thank you for what they call fascinating womanhood, that we don't aspire to be men per se. Uh, and, you know, we are strong in our vulnerability, being nurturers, being mothers and homemakers and also executives. Can you just imagine what the class of 1956 had gone through or even their forebears in the difficulties of facing an oppressive um, regime to where we are? So we know that it is possible. We know that women, our rightful place is in the forefront of the economy. And this is why we are here not to replace men or to have a hostile takeover. We are just here to add on to the work that has been done. So Convina, thank you. Thank you so much for your opening remarks. It's my privilege and pleasure now to also invite Minister of Tourism, and she's also the co-chair of the Economic Cluster in Cabinet, uh, Honorable Minister Mamoloko Kubai Ngubane, who will share her presentation with us. And Minister, your 15 minutes starts now. Thank you very much, um, Cindy. Let me acknowledge the GM, um, Comrade Phoebe, acknowledge um, the convener, Sasha, the advisor to the president, um, Trudy, Ad, um, acknowledge Dr. Swamile Vilagazi, acknowledge Gina Schumann. Thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this conversation today. As you have clearly said, um, I'm also a, I'm hoping it's quite visible. I'm also a convener in, um, co-chairperson in the economic cluster in government. Um, so I will also share based on that work that I do as well. Um, I thought it's important for us to, to take a stock on where is the state of our economy, um, where we also understand that prior to COVID-19, our economy was not doing very well. Um, we had challenges of an economy that was not growing. Um, we were downgraded um, just prior to, to um, COVID-19 incidences. And then um, many of us would have noted now that we just had um, the stats released this week, which gave us um, a decline uh, that the economy has contracted 51%. So that's, that's what we, we are in, in the process. But also the estimation that for 2020, um, we're going to see our economy contracting before between minus 5.4 to 7.7 .7, and others are saying average is 7.1. Currently high frequency data indicates the following, a declining in revenue collection. This is estimated to almost 285 billion tax shortfalls. A decline in trade and investment. Exports will be are estimated to be down by 50.43 billion. Imports by 12.87 billion increase in unemployment. This is based on the referrals from, from CCMA, where it's giving you indication based on what has been submitted
by the um, the employers in terms of um, their section 189. And then the estimation based on what NetBank has projected, it was saying that we're projecting for 2020 the loss of jobs to be 1.6 million. National Treasury projects between 2.7 to 7 million jobs within this year. Um, then we look in terms of our country, in terms of the persistent fault lines. Um, this is the past that we come from a background where apartheid in terms of special development, economic participation, education contributed to where we are. But also, um, you'd see that progress have been made characterized by dramatic increase in terms of service, basic services. Um, I know some people sometimes do not take this as progress. I mean, the fact that we've seen access to electricity in the country, increasing access to water, yes, we do have areas where there's still some challenges and all that. So basic healthcare system, access to education, those are some of the things that also assist us in terms of growth. However, South Africa continues to have an economy with two vastly different lived experiences. One poor and mainly black, one rich and mainly white. That's the reality of our economy. South Africa remains a highly unequal society where too many people live in poverty and too few work. We are saddled with the high levels of unemployment amongst youth and women. So this are high, we take more. Then the context now of why we need the recovery, importance of why we have to have the recovery. Given the state of our economy, the persistent fault lines in the country's need, definitely we need an economic reconstruction. And I'll talk to why it says reconstruction, because as you would have heard, the president pronounces to say, when you look at what COVID is doing in terms of the impact of the economy, like some subsectors, it does destroy. So, as part of, re of, of bringing back the economy, economic uh, recovery, you've got to understand that certain sectors that you have to reconstruct, you have to rebuild. Um, so it's almost like post-war, as it always says. To accelerate progress, deepen democracy, and build a more inclusive society, that translates to political emancipation into economic well-being for all. I will not go into this because I want to go into the noting that I don't have much time and I do have areas that I want to focus into. Basic principles that sort of um, guide our recovery, uh, both because we've translated what we have in the NC now we're working in, with it into in government. The infrastructure programs, including interventions in network industries, should serve as a basis of immediate, immediately igniting the economic recovery and I won't go into the other, so I've tried to make sure that we consolidate because noting that PBF has already had a discussion with Comrade Ino, together with other comrades in terms of starting the conversation around recovery. There should be a focus intervention to promote sectors of the economy, which amongst others, stimulates industrialization. There should be a focus on promoting small, micro, and medium enterprises. The macroeconomic stance should be underpinned by the coordination of fiscal and monetary policies and the mobilization of other financial instruments to ensure that the plan is sufficiently financed and financially sustainable. So it doesn't help to have a plan when you, do, you can't fund it. South Africa should strengthen its multi asserted a partnership with the rest of the African continent in line with the African continental free trade area. Black economic empowerment should be all organically wired into the plan's configuration. This is around the issues of transformation. We have to, in state, build a capable state to be able to deliver on the plans that we have and find the skills that we need. Sometimes there's a misunderstanding. People think when we say we must build a capable state, then the assumption is that there is no capacity in the state. There is vast capacity in the state. We are saying close the gaps where they exist especially around your capacities of project management and engineering. And then when you go to local government, for example, you find the difficulties include around financial, uh, uh, financial management. So sometimes people think that we do even lack governance. Those are vast skills that exist in government. Policy and governance, you find them quite rarely. So it's not completely that there isn't skills in, in the state and there isn't capacity. COVID-19 management has already showed us that when government works in a coordinated manner, 
government works focusedly, you are able to see the results. The private sector, workers, and the rest of civil society will need to be variously involved and jointly have critical contributions to make in devising recovery and implementation plans. So we're saying this is not only, should not be something that we talk about that focuses on government, but must be focused on everything. Then I want to go into the interventions per priority areas. The first priority area is ensuring energy security. This, the energy security can't build the economy when we do not have security of supply. If we continue to have the load shedding, if we continue ESCOM not being able to provide electricity for us, we cannot build the economy. So we've got to be able to secure the energy supply, whether it's through utilization of various technologies that exist, or also when we talk about energy security, we're also talking about petroleum products. So that work is what we're talking about. So we call it, this one is that the priority area as well, we talk to the implementation of the IRP. Then we go to a thriving industrial base that creates jobs. So we have to be conscious about that interventions of recovering and reconstructing the economy has to be based on creation of jobs. And this we can do in terms of ensuring that local manufacturing as well as firms and household in distress do actually have the backbone of localization as part of support. So if we are to ensure that industries buy local, we buy locally, either it's clothing and textile, either it's products that we use, that it will be able to build in terms of um, our capacity. Then we deal with the issue what people will commonly refer as reforms, where we have to see decisiveness and action immediately from government. In dealing with issues such as digital migration and land rights, removing the red tapes to ensure that uh, when you have people, you can be able to get to those work done. So strengthening regional and global trades as well. Mass public employment program as part of building um, the economy, it's important. Your EPWP, ECDs, they have capacity to be able to do this. Infrastructure that needs NDP 2030. Infrastructure, we're talking about sugar ready projects, no longer cutting off the ribbons before even the plans start. So we want to see that in the implementation, we are almost ready, we have done all the work and then it's shovel ready, we get ready. Two projects already have been announced by um, Comrade Speaker in the presidency around this. Uh, another area of intervention is macroeconomic intervention. Here we're talking about restoring and strengthening revenue collection capacity, dealing with illicit economies where you find in that your project disruption, your people who are stealing in terms of the mining sector, you deal with them. Strengthening collection of revenue capacity so that we can be able to have the money that needs to come in. So the issues of activities that are illegal, harboring of not paying taxes and all those things we want to see them dealt with. Review of the tax employment incentives is highlighted. Tax holidays and tax relief, this is part of the intervention, but also the issue of repurposing and reorganizing of the state-owned entities form part of the interventions. Green economy is very important. And that's why here there's issues around waste recycling, beneficiation, transition, circular economy, but also reducing uh, the issue of green bonds as part of reducing the carbon um, footprint. I'm noting your time. I don't want to spend more time, uh, but I did prepare we can circulate this. Food security is one of the areas of interventions as well, because we do believe that this is more critical and it's important for us to continue to look at this. There are opportunities for us as a country to export quite a number of areas around this and also import in terms of this. But we do believe that the agriculture review, the review of the Agriculture Marketing Act is important for us as well. And dealing with the issues around climate change too, and also ensuring that we do secure the food security here, food um, in terms of our work. Reviving the tourism sector, here we're talking about marketing, um, facilitation because we do want to emphasize that this is one of the areas where it's um, able to absorb mass jobs and also high and high skilled and low skilled uh, workers. But we're also saying because we've got to be able to provide for uh, supply base, so facilitation of programs that will stimulate uh, maintenance of the program that will contribute to EPWP works program, but also ensuring that our attractions are ready to receive tourists. And then dealing with the transformation here, we'll be able to implement the tourism equity fund as building, um, building for pipelines for the future conference and mega events as well.
women in the economy. Women here, we say, as we contextualize it, it's important as we work on this to understand where women find themselves within this. I tried in the process to highlight as I was talking. Women remain the most vulnerable in society, and this because women remain less likely to participate in the labor market than men. Global women are paid less. We still have gender pay, pay gaps that exist. They bear the disproportionate responsibility of unpaid care and domestic uh, work. 2019 fourth quarter labor force survey has revealed that at least 30.9% 30, 30 of, uh, of unemployed people are women compared to the male who are sitting at 87.7. More than half of South Africans populations is women, but yet 34% of those, if you look, they only form part of the 34% of SMEs. This is based on the research that has been done by World Bank in South Africa. UNDP as well looked at the impact of COVID in South Africa. And here the same, the female headed households are more likely to slip into poverty than male headed households based due to COVID. Secondly, women, particularly in the poorest female, female headed households, disproportionately bear the brunt of the impact of COVID 19. But here they are saying the face of poverty post COVID 2019 is black women specifically. So what is to be done as I conclude? I'll try and, and I'm seeing, Cindy, is my time up? I'm still fine. Are you, you're still good, uh, Minister, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, then we go into the issue. I didn't start my, my clock when I started, so I, I didn't see my time. So gender equality, what is to be done? We need to adopt a gender mainstreaming as a tool to achieve women emancipation, especially in relation to the economy. So we can't continue to think that it's going to happen automatically. So there has to be an agreement that we have to do this. Some of us will remember there was a time where there was a bill that was being introduced. I remember at that time it was Minister Susan Shabangu, who was Minister of Women in the presidency, where the bill was introducing penalties if, for example, both in public and private sector, we do not meet certain quotas. It was seriously objected. We didn't pass quite a lot of consultation to make it to parliament. And these are the policies that we need to start, legislation that we have to start looking at to come back. Because the issue of gender pay, pay gap does not, is not justifiable. The thing that we think is going to happen automatically is not going to happen. So to recover the plan, we'll have to adopt a set of actions that government and other stakeholders, especially in terms of our social partners, that we need to focus on the achievement of gender equality. This includes access to decent work, closing the gender pay gap, um, and also the issue around what we talk about, child, our household care and child care workload, ending the violence against women, participation of women in terms of powerful decision making. So we can continue to see what is happening in the GSE, where you have, you have less women um, the last time, I can't remember the recent stats, but we had almost less than, we have less than 3% or less than 5%, if I may to say, um, of women in terms of being CEO of companies in the JC, um, you know, listed companies. So it, it's not something that we need to do. Gender mainstreaming will be integral part of the reconstruction and recovery growth plan for government. And then I'm going to make an example, being a minister of tourism, we'll make an example as a tourism case study terms of the women in, in, in terms of the economy. We have a firm belief that tourism will be one of the fastest growing sector in the recovery period. And it will be one of the key sectors that will drive the overall economic recovery. Yoko Small Business Recovery Monitor, I don't know if many of us know Yoko, it's the small P um, points that are used by SMEs. Um, they showed that as of August 27, currently turned over, of the enterprise was up by from 71 percent in the comparative from the prior level so this is in terms of lockdown strategic level um what is risk adjusted levels from level five to level four at level two they saw the improvement in terms of participation women participation in the sector is up to 70 percent however they are finding themselves in the lower level so when you look at tourism set you have 70 percent of women being part of the tourism sector. But as you move higher in terms of the subsectors, you look for management, you look for ownership, then you don't find this women. They actually then form below 30% of that. So they are overall in number, 
but as you go into the ownership, you go to the management, you don't find them. So women face many challenges in the sector, which include the tourism sector has highly variable demand cycle, imposes unsocial working hours, because you'd have peak, you'd have off peak as well, but also because sometimes think about a, a restaurant where most of the restaurant will close at 11 o'clock at night. So sometimes women who are mothers tend not to want to participate because that becomes a constraint for, for them. Seasonal work can demand for very high levels of time commitment because you find, for example, in festive season becomes high peak for us. Then it demands a lot. For women, sometimes this becomes something that is deterrent because at that time the schools are closed, the children are home. So balancing between family, looking after the children and all that because we know they are the ones who are doing the household work. So that's what it means in this. Businesses can locate at some distance from residential areas, particularly in poor communities. So you find that in terms of attractions, they have to travel a particular distance to go to work from home, and that becomes another issue. Certain work areas, notably hotel and restaurant kitchens, are traditionally mainly preserves in terms of the sectors. And therefore, as work and others, the culture happens, it becomes difficult at times for women to find themselves. So our tourism recovery strategy, which will be unveiled very soon, we actually issued out and then we requested for public comments. We've received, we closed, and we are at the points where we are finalizing. It talks about gender mainstreaming and ensuring that transformation happens in the sector. Thank you very much, Cindy. I tried to run through so that I don't take your time and also I don't, but yeah, I really appreciate this opportunity and I hope I've sparked quite a lot of debate. I tried to give the background of where we are in terms of the recovery but also uh, the issue of ensuring that we do uh, link the women into the process and specifically make a case for tourism as the minister. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister, and we really appreciate, I think it's with the sensitivity that you've highlighted, the lived experiences of women, and you're speaking about the fact that we had been in a technical recession even prior to COVID-19. What is it that we are trying to answer differently? And just, uh, if you'll make a note, but I'll also remind you when we get to the questions and answers uh, segment, the convener wanted to know, what about the micro-businesses? Oh, mama, the ones about, about things are uh, alongside the road or uh, fresh produce who have to wake up early hours of the morning with the struggle that comes with, uh, you know, the income not being adequate to cover her own expenses as well. And uh, Convina was saying that 50% of these micro businesses are said to be owned by women. And in the main, probably single women whose husbands, because of urbanization, had either migrated to a greener pastures and have left another family that is um, broken and dysfunctional in that way. So when we grapple with these issues, can we also try and, and be empathetic towards those kind of businesses while we're trying to also maintain a healthy economy in, in, in the, um, the formal economy as it were. So thank you very much, Minister. Without any uh, further ado, I'd like to now introduce uh, Comrade Phoebe Potchiter. She's the general manager of the ANC, who earlier on was saying that she'd like to draw from lived uh, experiences and lessons in the African continent on how women are transforming traditional saving facilities or institutions into meaningful businesses. So it's over to you, Phoebe, uh, you, your 15 minutes starts now. Thank you very much, Program Director, Minister, and um, esteemed panelists, and to all of the participants, and both on social media as well as in the, in the Zoom room, as they say. What I'm going to do is to, to draw on three parts of my experience. The first one is to, I'm not going to repeat what Minister said, because I think she very adequately covered the ANC's proposal around the Economic Recovery Plan. But what I want to do is to talk about why is it important to talk about women in an economic recovery plan. Secondly, to draw on some examples from the African continent. And then thirdly, to look at the issues of young women and young people, because women and young people in Africa, in South Africa, represent the overwhelming majority of people. And therefore, if we talk about an inclusive economy, we have to make sure that our plans bring them into the fold. 
Now, Minister has said that, that the, the, the title of the Economic Recovery Plan is a new inclusive economy. And that for me is the, the, the most important part of it because we've had 26 years of, of, of democracy on the social sector we have done very well. Although there are issues that we need to, to, to look at um, in terms of um, you know, access to basic services between 1994 and today, we have made vast improvements. But the one area that, that we have not done as well is on the area of economic transformation. And therefore, the economic recovery plan is both to deal with the problem of how do we kickstart the economy after three uh, quarters of a technical recession and a real recession that we've seen with the latest figures, and how do we then kickstart economic transformation in the, in the country again? And in a new and different ways, look at it. Because often one uh, commentator made the point that, you know, we, we say that we want to go get back to the new normal. But the new normal in a South African context is not really what we want to go back to. We want to move forward and we want to look at how do we do these things in a different way. So let me start. Why inclusive economy? An inclusive in economy cannot be inclusive without 55% of the population. And women have been excluded because of apartheid, because of colonialism, but most particularly because of patriarchy. Um, excluded from the economy. So if you look at globally, women's access to assets, their representation on boards, their ownership of businesses, their ownership of land, of housing, all of it they find themselves at the bottom of the rung. And it's not surprisingly because patriarchy throughout the world expressed itself and deliberately excluded women from all of from economic power and restrained their, their, their role to the, to the private sphere. So, so, so if one look at assets and ownership in a South African context, it's also very specifically. For example, until 25 years ago, African women were regarded as legal minors, and it therefore meant that they couldn't bolt up assets, they couldn't buy a house without permission from a male person in their family, et cetera, et cetera. Um, influx control specifically uh, kept African and black women within their group areas or within the reserves and Bantustans, and therefore, in terms of those areas where economic activity was very little. So if one talk about looking at how do we then um, include women into that new inclusive economy that we want to build, we have to take in consideration all of these historical re reality. The minister also referred to the question about the reality of unpaid labor. So women predominantly are responsible for childcare, apart from giving birth to children, we're also responsible for rearing children, for looking after families, for looking after the elderly, the disabled, when the sick, and all of that is not counted in our GDP. It's unpaid, but women are expected to make that, that contribution. Um, in the economy, women um, increasingly are found in precarious in employment. Um, so in, 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 um, in sectors where apart from the informal sectors where there's not, it's not a decent work. They don't have access to, to medical aid. They don't have access to pensions, et cetera, et cetera. Then the other issue, which is a global phenomenon, but also South African, is the fact that women tend to then be um, in sectors where women predominate. Pay is generally lower. So if you look at, say, if you compare the textile sector with the um, engineering sector, pay is lower. Um, if you look at the pay for primary school teachers as against high school teachers, the pay is lower. So the trend is that in sectors where women predominate, the, the pay then generally drops. So we need to look at that in addition to the gender pay gap. So even where women are in circumstances where they do the same job, they work the same hours, they have the same qualifications, they have the same experience, they still earn at least 25% less than their male colleagues that are on the, on the same level. And then the last issue in terms of patriarchy, which, which um, I think Minister, given her previous position that she was in, is also with regards to innovation. So what you find 
is that women work on research projects in universities, in research institutions, but all of a sudden when it comes to the recognition, their names are not being mentioned. Um, they get shoved aside, etc. You know, and a, a classical example of that is the recent movie that was done called, uh, I think, Hidden Something, um, where, for example, it highlights the role of women scientists in getting the first person onto the moon. Um, and they were shoved aside, their role uh, hidden, etc. And so even in innovation, we see that happen and we need to look at how do we, how do we take that, that forward. So that's the, the first pass part of it, that any economic recovery need to understand the way that patriarchy impacted on women's role in the economy. And, uh, oh, it's called hidden figures, thank you. Um, and that we then very deliberately look at in every single sector that we're talking about, how do we then bring women into the, into the economy? So that's the one part of the issue. The second aspect that, that I just want to talk about little, a little bit is, and that's from my experience at the, at the African Union Commission, is some of the, the, the issues where we can learn from our, our sisters in the rest of the continent. And I want to use a few examples. The first one is that we have in the country a very strong, deep-rooted tradition of stockpiles. Um, so all sorts of stockpiles, burial society around groceries, around school clothes and shoes, etc., etc. It's a very strong tradition and they're very organized. And I think that somebody just mentioned that it's about, you know, an excess of 15, 16 billion uh, that's, that that sector contribute. But unfortunately, that sector has not helped to, to invest. Now, I, I recently re read a story of, of a similar situation of stock fells in Kenya, where the women, instead of only a portion of their money went into consumption, so groceries and uh, school fees and those kind of things, but what they also did was to use part of their money to build a hostel, a residence for students, and it means that they now have a long-term investment which they can uh, uh, draw money from in addition to what they put into the stock fell every, every uh, 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 month. The majority of stock fells in South Africa are run and, 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 and the members are women. And part of what we need to do is to look at how do we use this. For example, I was saying to, to, to our uh, program director, for example, our grocery stock fells. Why are we not putting some of the portions of those money to begin to buy into supermarkets? or buy into, into things so that we also look at how do we empower women in terms of investment, not just only in terms of consumption. So that's one example uh, from Kenya. There's a, an African organization that was formed a couple of years ago. I think it was in 2014, 15, if I remember correctly. It's called the African Women in Maritime. And how it started off was the, there was a discussion about the formation of an African maritime strategy because we've got a, a large coastline, we have two, two oceans as a continent, but we don't really exploit the blue economy. Um, we have large, vast, uh, uh, um, you know, we've got vast uh, uh, um, coastline, um, but as, 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 as a continent, we're not really involved in the shipping industry. And one of the things that, that, that the women in Maritime Africa said they want to do is to be able to start a pan-African shipping company uh, to bring together women from Togo, from South Africa, from uh, Ethiopia, from all over the continent to say that how do we invest in a pan-African women's uh, shipping line because only women in Togo or only in South Africa, we may not have the financial muscle to do that. So we need to look at how do we have those kind of pan-African initiatives so that we are able to build up our, our mass muscle. Another example is the question about, um, you know, the, the African network, there's an African network that look at agriculture and one of the objectives that, they, that they're looking at is to bring women together to, for example, uh, trade with each other amongst, uh, across the continent, um, to focus on, 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 on building uh, trade links amongst women across the continent um, and then support each other in, in, in that way. We have the African Continental Free Trade Area, 
And the assumption is that that's going to be for big business and often for male dominated business. But it's something that we need to look at as women. How do we build those networks across the continent? The third and last area that I, that I want to talk about in relation to the, to the economic recovery plan is the question about young people and particularly young women. Now, um, young people constitute about 70% of our, our population. So we can't really look at in building a new and inclusive economy without also look at, looking at how do we bring young people into the economy. And the minister spoke about the community public works. Uh, she spoke about the investment in the SMMEs, about those specific sectors that, we, that we're talking about. Um, and we need to have a specific um, consciousness, um, whether it is as government departments, whether it is as civil society, in order to ensure that we, that, that, that we bring young people in um, and bring them forward. Let me um, conclude by, by, by talking just about some of the aspects of the economic recovery plan that we need to continue to look at. M Minister talked about the importance of gender mainstreaming. It's absolutely critical that we need to look at every single initiative, whether it is financing and access to finance, whether it's the green economy, whether it is um, industrialization, from a gender perspective and make sure that we mainstream gender within these issues. Um, we need to look at rebalancing, as she said, the question about unpaid work, um, closing the gender pay gap. By the way, on the 18th of September, for the first time this year, the UN will be celebrating uh, International Equal Pay Day. I hope as South African women, we also do something on that day and maybe Sasha, the PBF can help us with that to be able to, to raise the profile of this issue of equal pay for, for equal work. So that's also part of it. But we, we, we're talking about, at a broader level, about a social compact. We need to ensure that women are also present in that social compact so that we don't find that whether it is in the trade union delegations, in the business delegations, and I notice uh, PBF when you were reading the names in your introductory remarks about all of the participants talking about the economic recovery, it was, I didn't hear a single woman being mentioned. We have to have to keep on knocking on doors. In 1990, the women through the Women's National Coalition uh, stayed to sit in at CODESA to be at the table. In 2020, we can't be doing worse than them when there is a discussion about an economic and new inclusive economy. We need to ensure that women are, are at the table. The question's about access to finance, and this is always something that, that, that um, I think that bothers a lot of us, that women tend to be, um, you know, all the research shows that women are more likely to repay their loans, they're more likely to keep up with their repayments, but when you look at access to finance for women, um, the, the tendency is still to rather give a loan to a, a male business or a male person, etc and women don't get access to, to, to finances. That's one of the issues that we need to, that we need to look at um, as a country, and that's part of the gender mainstreaming that, we, that we're talking about. Agriculture and food security, it's, it's absolutely important. We're talking as a country about land reform. We must not forget women, and the extent to which women have been triply excluded from access to land. And part of correcting the historical injustice is also to look at access of women to that, but also access to, to training, to, uh, uh, to seats, to implements, um, et cetera, et cetera, in addition to, to access to land. The green economy, it's a new sector. Um, it's the, one of the growth sectors of the future. Um, how do we mobilize women to be able to do that? Let me conclude by making two remarks. The first one is that as a country, you, it doesn't make sense to only use 50% of, ta of your talent. It does not make sense. It's not building an inclusive society and an inclusive economy to exclude and keep on excluding over 50% of your population. And we as women need to demand that we have that seat at the table, whether it's at NetLAC, whether it's in the Economic Council, and all of these things to be able to ensure that we get the gender mainstreaming going to. And then, of course, the, the second issue is how do we assist grassroots women to be able to, in their stock files, in, uh, as micro-entrepreneurs,
the SMMEs to be able to break into the green economy sector, the energy sector, into tourism, into all of these sectors. Um, and the best way to do that, um, as the minister, when she spoke about building a capable state, is to start at local government level uh, to be able to have that initiative as part of local economic development, but also within our different sectors, within the energy sector, within the tourism sector, within manufacturing, we need to be able to has, ensure that we have strong voices of women because we cannot continue to play with half our team. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, GM, Phoebe uh, and Thank you so much for, you, you've actually incited a lot of reaction and I'm now on the Facebook page. So we're all a community uh, live on Facebook. It's at ANC PBF and we're also on the chat room on Zoom. I'll try and capture as many of these comments but Nkosa um, Zanandjovo agrees with you to say it's about time, it's a brilliant idea to have a Pan-African shopping center, or at least if we can have acquisition in that space, and also exploring the ocean economy. Some of these concepts may seem abstract because we had not been, um, as a people, necessarily empowered enough to want to explore uh, the, those kind of industries. Another comment is from Diplomatic Mission Espatini, uh, around the on border gates being opened. And we had touched on the free trade areas, that it's not just as a privy to establish business, that we as micro businesses and uh, small scale subsistence businesses, we can find opportunities in that space. I love what, how you put it, that there's no way that we can have an inclusive economy when at least 55% of the population is not being included, especially for the unpaid work that we do. Many women will tell you under COVID-19, when you weren't able to have your domestic worker come in and assist, you had to be the janitor, the mother, the CEO of or, you know, whatever other business responsibilities that you had. So we need to look at the, I wouldn't call it burden, but the realities of what women have to carry in uh, their own personal development, contributing to the economy, dealing with gender-based violence, rearing children that are um, balanced and you know can contribute positively to the economy. So a number of things that you touched on there, Comrade Phoebe, I really, really appreciate it. And we're now going to go to our next speaker, uh, who is also an expert, and rightfully so, in her own space. And that is Trudy Makaya, who is the economic advisor to the president of South Africa. It's over to you, Trudy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Comrade Cindy, and thank you um, to the audience for spending some time with us this afternoon. Um, I'd also like to recognize um, Honorable Minister Kubain Gubani and for that wonderful presentation um, and the case studies that also uh, brought us to home on this issue. Um, and also the wonderful uh, input uh, by Comrade Phoebe, who really um, also gave us a continental perspective on some of um, what we're talking about today. Um, you know, the perennial roadblock um, that we always face when it comes to talking about women's economic emancipation is that there's always one more thing that needs to be taken care of uh, before we come to the women's issues. So now, you know, we're all terrified that that one more thing is now the pandemic. Let's just solve the pandemic, let's recover, and then we'll get back to the women issue. So I think we have to be very careful this time that we don't get sidelined and that we see that the recovery has to be seen from a gendered lens. Um, it's not that it's, we deal with one thing, then the next, but that by empowering women, we would be able to ensure that we um, have recovery. Um, you know, just a, a slight um, uh, digression in that we're also seeing a lot of data that's coming uh, across the globe as to how countries have performed. Um, and what we're seeing is that there isn't really that much of a trade-off between looking after your people, looking after the health, health of your people, and also economic performance. Um, so, you know, our economic performance, it's not the worst um, in global uh, perspective. If you look at year-on-year um, -year figures, uh, which is what a lot of people have been using to compare globally. You have countries like the UK, France, um, sitting at minus 20%, uh, minus 16%. Um, you have a country like Peru, um, unfortunate, sitting at minus 30%. 
Um, so we were in the ballpark, even though it's a very uncomfortable situation to be in. And yet at the same time, we've managed to have fairly um, moderate rates of fatalities. So we've, we've managed to have that balance that um, we didn't uh, prioritize uh, one at the expense of the other. We recognize that they are complementary. And I think that's something that also um, a gender lens brings to many issues where you realize that caring about human capital, investing in people, investing in communities does not come at the expense of economic performance. Now, I think uh, both the minister and Comrade Phoebe have been um, very articulate on the burdens or additional responsibilities um, that women have. And the fear is also that they might be the first ones that are retrenched um, as the, the recovery um, shapes up. Um, and so we have to make sure that the fact that they um, were the ones who any minute now my daughter could walk in and, and disrupt, we're the ones um, who have um, had to you know, see um, unavoidable knocks um, to the way we work, um, that that doesn't stigmatize us in the workplace um, going forward. I think some of the harm that's been caused to women um, in this pandemic and in the way um, that the, the burden falls, you know, it's not just the burden in the home, but it just also happens that women are the ones in the service sector. Women are the ones that are essential frontline workers. Um, you know, so they have, we have been at the forefront of this. And I think one way to compensate that harm is to ensure that we build systems, um, an ecosystem that supports women's economic inclusion. We've all heard the slogan, build back better. Um, you know, we know in our own um, context that we have an economy that's very much uh, based on exclusion. I mean, just reflecting on some of the experiences um, that I've had, um, in, you know, in, in professional settings, uh, being in the competition uh, policy sphere uh, before I, you know, I, I got into this job, there were so many instances in so many sectors where you see how you can have phenomenal growth, phenomenal investment in those sectors, but women don't benefit. Um, you know, retail, the retail sector is very much um, in the news this week. And when I started working on retail cases um, at the Competition Commission, you know, you, you are shocked at some of the insights um, that you get. You know, you walk into a supermarket and you think it's all hunky-dory. Um, the products that are on that shelf got there on merit or because people like them, etc. But it's not that. There's a whole game behind the scenes around buying uh, promotional materials. You know, as a supplier, you have to pay for your own promotional materials. Um, as a member of a category, say um, you're selling shampoo, um, the retailer often chooses one of your competitors to manage the placement of that shelf. Um, they call them category cap uh, champions. And so you are subject in some ways to the whims uh, of your competitor. Um, and then at the same time, the demands that you have in terms of meeting the volume and the scale of orders um, that you have to maintain, otherwise you're dropped from, from the supplier list is often very onerous. So even in you know, a sector where you might think, oh, women might have a chance here, just come up with a great product, put it on the shelves, um, it's not that simple. So we have to build it back better and keep fighting um, against those forces uh, of exclusion. Now, looking at the recovery, um, the reconstruction and recovery um, plan, it's very clear um, from this plan, but also across social partners, that infrastructure is going to be a very important part um, of this recovery. It's going to be an infrastructure-led recovery. Um, and it, you know, the, the, the benefits are obvious. We, we have creaking infrastructure, it's labor intensive, it boosts the construction center sector, and it also engenders competitiveness um, across the economy. So it, it makes sense to, to really um, focus on that. But we all know it's not a sector that has been most embracing uh, of women. If you look at the whole infrastructure delivery from design, engineering, quantity survey, all the way to building construction maintenance, um, we have to be very activists to ensure that that infrastructure led recovery doesn't reinforce patterns um, that we've seen. Um, government has been very clear and the president has been quite a champion uh, of women's economic empowerment 
And to say that we're going to bring the full suite of tools of gender empowerment to the recovery. So there's the ambition, for instance, to ensure that all state procurement um, targets 40% towards women-owned businesses. Um, we're trying to advocate for a similar level of ambition by the private sector and also on the continent through the AU chairship to get other heads of state on the continent um, to make similar commitments. And so there's been work to set up the institutional mechanisms to support um, that ambition, that 40% target. And it's about getting women and women-owned businesses procurement ready. Because once again, we can talk about a target, but we've got to make sure um, that there's readiness um, to take it up. So there's been partnerships with UN Women, with the SABS, with financial institutions to get women to that stage where they can navigate um, what can be a very complex uh, procurement um, system. We also need to keep paying focus to the idea of women participating and creating businesses at scale or, or businesses that scale. So small business is very important. Um, I think the reconstruction plan articulates brilliantly when it says that the approach to micro enterprises should be based on the appreciation of the profound reality that these are activities through which the poor and marginalized take the initiative to exercise individual and community agency. You know, I, I quote that in full because I don't want to be seen to take away from the very importance of micro enterprise, of cooperatives, of small business. At the same time, we have to resist the temptation to always talk about women-owned businesses as small business, uh, because we also need to think about creating those champions, those national and continental champions that are women-owned. Um, I suppose I would be a little biased. I think um, government development finance institutions have tried um, to push um, the, the, the women agenda in terms of um, directing financing uh, if we look at an IDC, uh, which has, um, you know, directed 11.7 billion over the past five years. If you look at the NEF over the past 10 years, 40% of their funding has been towards women. It's not nothing, but the fact that it could be more and we should be doing uh, much more. And so there's a sense that there's going to be a financing ecosystem that also takes this into account to ensure that we're not only creating survivalists or small businesses, but that women's businesses can also get listed on the stock exchange, can also uh, be those amazing M&A acquisitions that we read about, that you know, for a chain it has to be a women's business um, that, that headlines that. At the global level, of course, there are also many efforts to develop um, innovative financing initiatives directed towards women. Um, we're having a conversation not long ago with the United Nations on the idea of a gender bond, a sovereign um, gender bond that would help um, a government. It could also even be a commercial bond that helps the business to raise financing with the explicit aim that they would be penalized if they don't meet the gender commitments to that. So you'd pay a higher interest rate if you don't meet the gender commitments of that program. And I think that is a way as opposed to build into the logic of a market economy to try um, and drive women's empowerment. So I think there's a lot of um, exciting initiatives on the horizon, but as ever, I think, you know, the caution I said earlier, we have to be careful um, that it doesn't become recovery first and women later. So thank you very much. And um, thank you um, to be part of this esteemed panel. I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. Uh... Comrade Trudy, we really, really appreciate. And we see the future leader is there behind you saying that, mommy, I need this throne. I'm prepared to lead already. But thank you for taking the time. And you really got me at this perennial problem. This is the fundamental problem that we're sitting with, that the goalposts are always shifted. If only you can reach this particular milestone, then we'll do something for women. You're saying that you know there's always one or the other thing and not to be sidetracked. Uh, by the, the COVID uh, pandemic because there'll always be something else that we need to be mindful of the complexities even in industries that we want to position women in on how the machination behind it has made it so difficult because these are essentially rules that we hadn't written ourselves 
for ourselves and by ourselves. So I'll let you attend to Princess in the background, but please stay with us. There are a lot of questions that are coming through on the chat group. And uh, there's a gentleman that wants to get your contact details if possible. If you're able to just forward your uh, contact details. And there's also a question around how to register your business. I think maybe people are also frustrated in the uh, type of platforms that we have currently, and they just wanna you know, um, access this particular network. So if you will, please uh, truly uh, afford us the contact details. Thank you very much again for those remarks. And everybody else that's watching, we're trying to make notes. Uh, we see you, you say woman power, ANC leads, ANC lives. We also have another comment uh, that speaks about uh the economy and also opening up the borders so as many of those as possible i'll try and sort of um oscillate between the platforms so our next speaker is uh, is uh, dr Spongile Vilagazi, who is an academic and business strategist and she'll also talk about the perspective from the millennials and young people and the frustration of why we cannot expedite and move things in the context of uh, the fourth industrial revolution dr Vilagazi, your 10 minutes starts now thank you Thank you so much. Am I am I mute now? I'm muted now. I see I am. Okay. Thank you so much, Cindy, for that um, and for the invitation specifically. You know, to also contribute to 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 this topic, which I think is quite important. And I, I thought it's interesting how the question is framed. You know, when I looked at it, the importance of women in economic recovery. Um, you know, it's neither a question nor a statement. It, it just is. And you can decide how you decide how to, how to tackle it yourself. So I've chosen to say that um, you know uh, there can be no economic recovery without women as priority in that. So as in all the strategies that we're putting together and tactics, uh, it's just not possible for, for to have a, 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 a an economy that will recover without putting women at the center. So essentially, I'm building on what Trudy has said, that it's not either this or that. It's women has to, have to be integral um, to, to, to the strategy. And um, I find it also interesting, the question that was used to develop the plan. Because when I, when I read the, the, the plan, the Reconstruction, Growth, and Transformation uh, Plan, um, the question that was used to come up with the solution was, what needs to be done to build a fast-growing uh, more resilient and more inclusive economy. Um, I, I, I really thought about that. I looked at that question and I said, you know, sometimes we need to spend more time in thinking about the questions that, um, you know, rather than the, the answers, you know. Sometimes when you ask the right questions, you get the right answers. And when you, when you didn't spend time on the question, you get an answer that sometimes does not give the solution that is desirable. I mean, when we look at the economy and how as uh, 25 years later, as a country where we are right now, we are in a very dire um, situation. So it's quite important that uh, we spend more time in the kind of questions that we are asking, um, you know, to, to get the right answers that we need. And um, from where I'm sitting, I think it's probably time now we start thinking how questions, we start asking how questions rather than what questions, what needs to be done. I think we know what needs to be done. I think we've come up with a, a whole lot of solutions over and over um, that basically gives us the what. What, what do we need to do? Um, you know, what needs to be done? And maybe it's time we start asking ourselves, how do we do it? You know, uh, rephrase some of these questions. You know, how should we build a fast growing, more resilient and more inclusive economy rather than what? Because when we talk about what, we come up with all these um, initiatives that we can all take. Um, but they just don't get us where we need to be going. So let's reframe the question. Let's, let's ask ourselves, how do we do this um, now? Uh, you know, how do we grow this economy? How do we ensure that the economy is inclusive? What do we need to be doing? What kind of leadership do we need um, to drive us there to where we need to be going? You know, so, and as, as I said, my posture to this topic is that you, there cannot be a recovery without women at the center. Women have to be at the center of this recovery. 
And um, uh, I will draw some of the lessons that I, I, I took from two books that coincidentally came out around the same time last year um, that I hope that you, you can all just go in and, and, and read them because I think they are quite telling in how we've approached um, the, the, the question of transformation in this country. A book by Nodita Fagute, Boardroom Dancing, and Nyatin uh, Teto, um, Betting on a Ducky. Uh, I found those two books that, and the fact that they came out around the same time quite um, enlightening because these are two authors who've decided to share their lived experiences of um, navigating their corporate lives or, you know, in its biographies. So you can take from it what you wish to take, what you want to take from, from it as a lesson, as lessons. And what I've decided to take from, from those two books was the story of transformation in this country. And, and how we've gone about it. Here are two um, individuals, male and female, uh, both very successful in their, in their, in their, in their own right. Um, they've done very well in navigating a, a space that um, was quite harsh, um, you know, and they've both gone about it in, in their different ways. But the similarities are also quite stuck. Like it, 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 it almost reads like the same person writing the same story. And then the, the, the difference is also um, are, are striking because the differences tend to be gender specific. Um, you've got Nyati and Nolita Fagute coming from families that were, you could argue, they were quite uh, middle class for, 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 for black people at a time. Um, both of them uh, led by very strong women, a grandmother on one side and a, and a mother and another side, a mother, very strong women who started businesses at a time where probably you, you would question that they would be able to do that. And they were successful at it. They started driving cars, they bought themselves cars, they were driving around, um, and also contributing to the community, making sure that they are helpful in the community. And both of them, they grew up in those shops, um, serving the communities and, and, um, you know, and, and, and helping where they, can, where they can help. So very much the same, they go on to grow in their careers and they, they get exposed um, in the world. And the difference is where you start seeing them is where um, uh, the gender specific, some of the gender specific differences where uh, marriage starts coming in, Nolita having to um, think, start thinking about uh, the effect of getting married, whereas Nyati is busy building his career and he only gets married once his uh, career is uh, almost established, not really there, but almost established. Whereas Nolita gets married earlier. Um, and considering some of the conditions that uh, uh, people can find themselves in marriage, she could easily have left um, her career and focused more on her, on, her, on her marriage, considering the challenges she also specifically faced um, that she discusses in the book. So you can go and read the book for yourself and find all of those things. But what I wanted to take out of that is some of the issues that we, we miss when we look at, at the transformation agenda. We've done quite well, as the previous speakers have, have, have highlighted some of the, the successes that the ANC government has had um, you know, when it comes to growing the economy and, the, and, the, and changing the lives of people um, in, in, in tangible ways. Um, but we've also overlooked some things um, you know uh, one of those things that we've overlooked is the question of class you know um, you know we talk about the economic recovery and because we're not talking about how are we going to get there we sometimes forget that there are people who by virtue of their close proximity they will benefit better more than others um, so what's our plan for that you know what's our plan for the most vulnerable um, those who will come last um, and the lessons that you see from those two books, you realize that um, because of their proximity, the two authors, um, they did benefit um, from the policies that the country had shaped. Um, you know, the, it's close proximity from a, a, a class perspective, but also from the foundation that they've had um, from home, you know, being raised to believe in yourself, have a strong self-esteem, and therefore be able to take up um, challenges and succeed in those challenges. Not everyone has those kind of um, privileges. So what do we do for those when we talk about the economic recovery? You know, when we talk about opportunities, what do we do for those people who may be more um, 
uh, disadvantaged than others, even though they may be in the same kind of segment. We may all be black, but we're not all having the same kind of situation. We've, we know there's a question of class even amongst black people. How do you address that? And then we also know the question of women, that even in those two stories, as much as they both succeeded in their careers, when you read the books and you read closely, you will realize that Nolita had to fight slightly harder um, for her to be in the position that she's in because of some of the social norms that make it difficult for a woman, um, you know, and they favor men. Um, and these are things that we, we, we may not be wanting to talk about them, but they are they. Um, and it's, it's norms that are subtle um, and they, they just make it difficult, more, much more difficult for a woman. So we may come up with all these initiatives and come up with all these great um, sectoral um, ideas for how do we grow the economy and make it inclusive in those. But if we're not mindful of some of those um, subtle um, social norms and that patriarchy, if you may want to call it that, that just makes it a little bit more difficult. So what is our plan for that? You know, how do we, how do we manage that? Um, and, and also then when you look at, I mean, uh, Comrade Phoebe has, has touched on it and also the minister have looked at it, they've, they've touched on the statistics, doesn't matter which industry you look at, you will see that women are the hardest hit in everything that we, are, we, we talk about. Women are the most disadvantaged in our society, specifically uh, black women. So it would be a, a, a mistake for us uh, to come up with a, a, an economic plan that does not take that into consideration. That does not uh, reference women as the, as the backbone of society. We know any research that you can look at will tell you that women tend to um, uh, fight harder for their families, I mean, it's been already mentioned. Women tend to um, sacrifice more um, for the bigger picture, you know, for the, for the good of the society. So any plan that does not take women as, as central in that uh, will be a grave mistake. And, and when I read this plan, I was a bit um, uh, uh, disappointed that women are seen as just another segment. It is women and youth and people with disability and all of that, it's just another. It shouldn't be just another. Women have to be at the center. They have to be central in, 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 in the decisions and the ideas that we're coming up with. So um, uh, for instance, when we also look at um, social research, um, and information around uh, social behavior, we know that women will do the right thing when it comes to the advancement of society. So we have to support them. The plan has to support them. So if we talk about infrastructure-led recovery, we have to talk about um, what is the role of women there? You know, how do we integrate women? How do women benefit um, in, the infra in this in in infrastructure-led recovery? And if we're talking about promoting investment in key productive areas, we have to talk about how do we make women central in that. And I, I, I like the point that was made that gender mainstreaming going forward has to be the biggest uh, strategy for how we get there. And I hope that we can drive that strategy quite firmly. Um, looking at the time and uh, I can see that I'm already run out of time. So thank you so much again for this opportunity. Um, and I'm hoping that these conversations Will, will be a start, that they, let's start focusing on women. And as Trudy also said, just to echo her as well, um, it can't be recovery first. It has to be an integrated plan that integrates women. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Vilagazi, and really much appreciated. In, in, and I love what you're saying, that we need to spend more time thinking about the how questions. I mean, it's, um, you know, the, this economic recovery plan is a culmination of so many other interventions that were meant to have made the second transition more profitable and beneficial for those who were marginalized and primarily a black women who still faces the brunt of the triple uh, challenges of uh, poverty, exclusion, discrimination, uh, and also unemployment. But I really, really like the how question, to rephrase the question on how to build a resilient and inclusive economy. So thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna just quickly try and go to the comments. If, if any of the, the uh, speakers especially, or participants, if you're able to go into the chat, you'll see that there seems to be a thread on the interaction 
on people saying they have been frustrated, they have interventions, they have programs that they think would be able to create this egalitarian society that we want with women at the forefront of the economy, and yet they're not getting an audience. But in the main, it's agreeable, and I think we have a level of frustration that something ought to give. It's no longer acceptable to say that uh, resources are limited or all sorts of things. We just need to refocus um, the energies towards women and meaningful women empowerment. So Dr. Vilaga is a Kulu for that. And we have uh, our speaker, Gina Skuban. She is with Citibank Global. Gina, and I do apologize for not edifying you adequately, but it's also deliberate so that you can essentially blow your own horn, if you will. So Gina, thanks so much for joining us. You're welcome to introduce yourself. Tell us about the fantastic work you do in your area of influence and then get into your presentation. You have 10 minutes. Welcome. Great. Thank you so much. And first, let me say a big thank you to the Minister for the presentation up front. I think it touched on all the economic issues um, at hand for sure, and a great summary of the economic transformation paper recently put out by the ANC. Thank you to all, my, all of my panelists. And it's always a little bit tricky when you, when you go after everyone, because I've been sitting here trying to change my notes so I don't echo what has already been said, um, but you will also see that I'm going to emphasize some of the things that have been said, because they are just so important. I don't think we should ever stop hearing them again. Um, just to give you maybe some background on myself, um, I'm the South Africa, well, I'm a South African, born and bred, I'm very proud to be it, and I'm the South Africa economist at Citibank. Citibank has uh, quite a big presence in South Africa, not in retail banking, but um, in transactional corporate banking, um, institutional banking, and then also we have a research arm, which is where I fall in, and I actually head up that research team. Um, so I've been looking and analyzing this economy for a very long time. And what I am very proud to say about City, before I, I give you a summary of my views on gender and in econo uh, economic recovery, is that just this afternoon, literally half an hour before we started this forum, um, City globally announced that its new CEO, CEO would be Jane Fraser. And that means that this is the first Wall Street bank that will have a female CEO. And I cannot tell you how proud that makes me to be working for a global organization that has recognized the need for gender equality. Um, I really, I still get goosebumps when I say it because I think it's, it's such a step in the right direction. And I think we all learn so much more by example than by anything else. Um, what I'd also like to just uh, point out is that I form part of the global research team at City. And believe me, it's an honor to be there because you've got all sorts of great minds and thinkers. And we have a series of global economic papers um, called Women in the Economy. And there are three parts to this so far. Um, I, I didn't choose to do you know, a whole numbers presentation, but I am very happy to share this, um, these reports afterwards for anyone who, who needs some further reading um, how gender equality is going across the world, world and why it is so important, particularly for inclusion, for economic growth inclusion. And that's where I'm going to start off today by telling you that any economist will tell you there is no silver bullet to getting growth back. There's no silver bullet for sustaining growth. And there's no silver bullet for making growth inclusive. It takes a lot of things. But let me point out that we certainly have a silver lining. And that silver lining is right here in front of us. And when I say right in front of us, I mean, literally, I'm looking at that silver lining because Women drive economic growth when given greater opportunity to participate equally in the labor force and can serve as growth accelerators. Now, this is not just a thought. This has started to be proven by all aspects of research around the world. I mean, women make up half the world's population. Um, we know they make up roughly half of South Africa's population. And we've heard already um, how we can't leave out half the team. Now, The Economist, which is a publication that obviously I read as an economist, but um, is very good at, at summarizing across the world some of the biggest themes. They've estimated 
that the increase in female employment in advanced economies, so that's not us in the emerging market space, but at least in advanced economies, what we can learn is that the, the increase in female employment over the last decade has been the main driving force of advanced economic growth, more so than new technology and more so than the new giants such as China. So in other words, our gender alone, at least in the advanced world, the advanced economies of the world, um, is able to grow those economies more than the emergence of iPhones and Zoom, which we're all using at the moment, and even China. And I think that's quite something. I think it's something we should use as a yardstick and a gauge to see what, what our potential here in South Africa um, could be. Now, globally, what I'm very happy to see is that the relevance of gender in economic growth has moved into mainstream research. There is a very impressive um, growing body of literature um, from the IMF and the OECD and the UN and the World Bank and even the G20 um, have included women as a driver of growth now um, in their agenda. So I think, you know, where we have an opportunity here is that there should be no economic plan that does not have um, women as part or uh, as a sub plan, as a as a as part of that economic plan, as to how to create the type of growth that economy wants. Now, let's maybe just think about why why women maybe weren't taken as seriously in economic growth before. And I think it's important because we need to be very careful that we don't find ourselves there again. Um, they have been underestimated because typically GDP growth calculations do not include assumptions and measures for a lot of the things that have already been mentioned here, such as unpaid care, household work, child care, elderly care, sick care, and we all know that that is dominated um, by females in any country. The informal economy is also underrepresented typically in any GDP growth equation. Um, and we also know that women typically dominate, um, particularly in terms of numbers in the informal economy. So we come to realize that women are truly enablers. Um, the multiplier effect of the economic activity of women is extremely high. So firstly, what all the research has shown, and the World Bank paper from 2012 is probably a good one to, to look up. Um, women typically use more of their income to invest in their families, to invest in health, education, and welfare. This creates a very sustainable boost to human capital. And that's the type of investment that also sadly doesn't always get captured in the GDP growth equations. It only comes up a lot later and no one can really draw down a solid line as to why one population might have um, more stable generations simply because women were able to participate more in, in their, their, their upbringing. The World Bank paper from 2012 also shows um, that increasing the share of household income controlled by women actually changes the spending patterns in the ways that it benefits children. And yes, South Africa is also included in this study. So women's track record of investing in children and especially in girls, young girls, creates a very virtuous cycle for an economy. Children learn best by example. I mean, that is very powerful for our children of South Africa to see women empowered would allow them to become empowered themselves. We know women are capable. So we were talking about a capable state. And I think that women participating in the economy in a much greater way will enhance those capabilities going forward. I mean, after all, I think we all know, as Trudy um, pointed out with her daughter walking behind her, we are multitaskers. Science is shown our brains are just wired that way. So the one step back and the one unfortunate part of all of this, um, also Trudy mentioning this, COVID-19 and the 2020 recession this year across the world. It has been more than an unfortunate step back in a way because it's a step back both in inequality and a GDP problem. Our estimates at City is that the female labor force participation is going to take a much worse knock 
due to the 2020 shock across the world than that of men. And again, I'm not saying this is females against males. It's not women against men. This is about finding ways so that the next time we get a crisis, we make sure that it's not the females that are part of the labor force that take the brunt of the layoffs and the job cuts due to the higher female representation in sectors that could be most vulnerable to a pandemic or the type of shock that we're currently feeling. But another issue in the background, and this was also spoken of, but I cannot stress this enough, as a working mother of three children myself, women were burnt out because of the lockdown situation. We might be multitaskers, taskers, but I think many women faced lower productivity simply because you actually cannot do it all. I know it's a, it's a slogan that we often like to say we can do it all, but women need more assistance in terms of being more productive in the economy by finding ways to gain support in their homes and their homes own productivity. So women cannot do it all and we need policies and particularly support from businesses in this regard. Now, thinking about some of the policy responses around the world for countries that are trying to find more gender equality, they're necessary because we want to empower women in the economy. It's, it ranges from pay parity, um, anti-discrimination uh, initiatives, uh, family-friendly workplace support, a corporate board and management diversity. Some countries even have tax breaks uh, for specific gender targets. And then I know this was also mentioned and I want to emphasize it. Um, when you start thinking about investment, what's really a great, uh, what's really going to help support a move towards empowering women, particularly in, in economic growth, is that investment targets in the world are leaning more and more heavily towards ECG targets, so environment, social, and governance targets. So many of my clients at City, global investors looking around the world, they absolutely have to hit these ECG targets, and they actually are not permitted to invest in a country unless they tick these boxes. Um, and, and uh, you know, similarly, when the, the mentioning of the UN gender bond, that would be exactly the same thing. Targets are important, incentives are important. I also think it's, it's, it's refreshing that global institutions are starting to play a more important role. The IMF, for example, they have started to mainstream structural labor market reform and inclusive growth policy advice to include gender. Now, this is crucial because the IMF's research and advice to all their member countries and surveillance of mandates, it elevates the need for increased female labor, labor participation. I'm, I don't know this for sure, but I suspect that in our future, even if it's in 10 years time, the IMF will have specific targets on gender that countries, member countries, will very likely have to um, have to meet. Otherwise, it could have implications to being a member. Uh, it might have implications to asking the IMF for any type of support or help in the future. And as I start ending off, I also want to get to the point of education. We spoke about it earlier, but education is a very key element. South Africa is not so bad on this front. The gender gap in primary schooling is mostly closed. It's also mostly closed across um, uh, the globe, as is secondary schooling. But we have to, have to ensure that we don't see a gap like this open for any type of crisis, for any type of economic shock, or as we co continue to push the economy recovery along. A couple of salient points on, on South Africa's economy. I'd like to point out the industrialization um, that we spoke of and the need for this to, to take part in the economic recovery. Now, if you have a look at South Africa's unit labor cost by sector, what I always find fascinating and certainly an opportunity for us is the manufacturing sector of South Africa. The unit labor cost in the manufacturing sector might be one of the highest across sectors, but that's more because of wages and not because of a lack of productivity. If you strip out the equation of unit labor costs 
for the manufacturing sector in South Africa. What you will see when you start measuring productivity across sectors is that it is actually one of the most productive sectors we have. If, if my memory serves me correctly from when I did the research um, on a 10 year average view, it was second to financial services. And that is an opportunity for us because if we've got that productivity, we certainly can build on it. And it's not to say that it, it, you cannot have female participation in the manufacturing sector because the manufacturing sector itself takes all supply chains into account. And supply chains are, of course, this is what Trudy was mentioning, that is where you start getting the spin-offs to bring in other types of industries where female participation is already quite high. Women are entrepreneurs and we are networkers. And this is where I'll, I'll bring in some of my own personal experiences. Um, I form part of the Women in Financial Services uh, supporting and networking group. It's very new. Uh, we, uh, it was put together about three years ago. Um, all the local banks are, are, are participating in, in the STIACO um, and then some of the global banks such as myself. And the main purpose of this is that we, this is created in order to help and support women in senior positions in the financial services industry to help uplift and to help network and, and to help support. Now, what I think we can learn from something like that, it's not difficult to start a group like that in your own industry in order to support, in order to uplift. And where, this, where I fall on another personal experience of myself um, of, of my career in this regard is that when I was a junior economist, um, I, was, I was working at Standard Bank and I really wanted, I was doing a lot of property economics, I really wanted to get into something bigger and better and, and, and next thing I knew, I was reading the financial mail and I saw an economic column written by uh, Nazmira Muller who is now co-head of um, investment banking at Investec. But at the time, she was part of quite a small bank called Macquarie. And I emailed her and I asked her if she might be willing to have coffee with me, just to teach me about how she came to be, um, you know, an economist in South Africa. And so we met for coffee. And about halfway through um, having coffee, I realized I was being interviewed for a position. And that really started to push my career further um, to finally find myself here at City, uh, something I'm very honored to, to, to role I'm honored to be in. Um, just to finish off here, in South Africa, I think we all know the statistics about labor participation of females. Um, it's not as high as males. We know that 41% of households are headed by females. But one issue I think is very important here is that Females need to feel safe when they are mobile in the labor force. And here again, I'll stress what's been said before, we're very lucky. Our president champions gender equality. Our president champions um, anti-gender violence. You know, he is vehemently against gender violence, but it is something we have to work at so much in South Africa, because if you can't feel safe in your workplace, if you can't feel safe in your homes, it's probably not going to have a very good effect on your confidence, which is very important when you start um, uh, moving into, into the economy and into the labor force. So I'll end, up, end off by saying, you know, that's, that's my, my two cents. Um, and I've always thought that if you empower women, you empower the economic potential of the country. So thank you so much. Gina, Gina, thank you so much for um, your powerful presentation. And it just really echoes the sentiment that we're all essentially after the same thing. You know, we want to have security, uh, prospects of employment, be able to provide for our families. But I think something that we also overlook, which was part of your presentation, is how we're trying to juggle as women. You know, the life work balance and being super mom, just because we're engineered in such a way that we are capable of carrying a lot, I think we're often also guilty of neglecting ourselves. And thank you for, you know, the, the, the support, highlighting that it is possible, there's a silver lining. You've given us renewed hope 
And I think that is often also forgotten because of the human isolation that we had to endure and not being able to hug and share love and compassion as women would do. That uh, this is a reminder that we need to go back to those basics, the things that matter, to say I am available to open up my networks and assist in whichever way possible. And uh, you know, sometimes we get lost in all these murky waters that happens around us, but uh, thank you for that. I think that's what we needed to hear, that there is a silver lining. And, uh, and I think we'll be, we'll be okay. So without any further ado, please go back to your questions on the Zoom chat if you're able to do that. We have one from um, Ms. Kima Ndaba. She's the founder and CEO of N uh, ZNP Solutions. We've been wanting an audience with Trudy. And then we have another one on economic recovery, Kino Musa Matiwane who says women, especially in rural areas, there are a lot who are not exposed to what we're talking about and uh, empowering them with knowledge. And, there's, and those women can be given the right platform. And I think we, we are guilty to a fault where we speak to the converted and uh, often the, the, the information doesn't cascade down to what it is that we're trying to do. I just quickly wanna throw this one to the panelists and um, if it pertains to specifics, then we, you're most welcome to, to jump in. Uh, Minister, can we just go back on, maybe to capture in the, in the next 15 minutes and also um, to round off your, your conclu uh, conclusion or notes, is, is the fact that what question were we not able to answer, and this was part of your presentation, that during the good times, as it were, when the economy was prospering, albeit it was a sluggish one, what questions are we still trying to answer today and what, what, what is going uh, to be different with this economic recovery plan? Thanks, Siri. I, th I think we didn't, it's, it's not that, you know, the weakness with, with us most of the time is it's not that we don't ask the right questions. We do ask the right questions. And most of the time, we do find proposals. Um, we do quite a lot um, in terms of it. Our weakness mainly is around being able to follow through on things that we've identified as challenges and possible solutions to implement them so that we can see where they take us. I made an example with the bill that um, Minister, uh, former Minister Susan Chabang, we had proposed. I mean, that bill was talking about closing the gender pay gap. That's one of the issues. It was talking about the issues of pushing through the numbers in terms of women representation, both in public and private sector. So the issue of quota, which was being introduced because we do acknowledge, I know there are certain people who are against quota, but we do believe that quotas play a quite, a quite critical role in what needs to assist in terms of women. But the other issue, for example, I think we've not been, where I think as government we need to, to strengthen our hand, is for example, where there isn't transformation, where there isn't mainstreaming of women, they become punitive issues. We have the bargaining powers in terms of for example, we can utilize our own procurement systems. We can utilize quite a number of ways. If a company like we do, for example, and that's why I was taken to court and I had to fight, to say, in terms of tourism relief fund, I am obligated to implement it in terms of um, the triple B E codes, and I'm not going to ban We were taken to court, we fought, and the courts were within us because we believed it's the right, the right thing. Similarly, with women. It shouldn't be an issue that it depends who is in the leadership. It depends if it's Mamuluko in tourism, she will push for transformation, she would push for, for women participation and programs that support women. But then when we move, somebody else comes and then we get, you know, put off. So it's something that we've got to be able and hold each other accountable, see. Not only in government, because sometimes I think we're very good in holding government accountable but we're not good at holding business sector accountable. For example, I'll put Sasha, maybe let's call the guys in the, in the business sector. Let's ask them the progress that has been made in terms of gender equality in the private sector. Why do we have, I mean, it is lucky now we've got Sisbo Nene appointed as CEO of um, Banking South Africa. But out of the banking CEOs, for example, in the country, where are the women? 
CEOs. You know, those conversations, because if we can't even sort out these basic things of representation, both in all the structures, then we would have a problem in terms of even just biasness of the issues. Because, and, and you find, the, that's why you find condescending. For example, I'll share as an ex experience I've had as a minister. And sometimes I do feel, what about a, 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 a woman who's a cleaner or a, an administrator in the sector? When I got to science and technology, I got invited to, a, to come and speak at a session by young people through social media. I go, it's engineering forum in Khaldi. I go then, comes national guys, white hair, gray hair, old men, they arrive. As they arrived, I introduced myself. They look at me, I think they just saw a young woman, not a minister. And at that time, one of them says to me, oh, by the way, we've, we've had former ministers of science and technology as honorary to our programs. So depending how you speak today and how you articulate, would be able to, I mean, it was said to my face, uh, it, will, it will depend if you make me. So I said, it depends if I want to be associated with your organization with such values. That was because I say my mind, I don't mind, I, I do. But I'm just making this example. You look during COVID-19, I don't know if how many of you have seen, the abuse that I was subjected to online, there was actually a, a, a website created that was literally just to insult me. At some point, somebody didn't made, how do you have a social worker? I didn't know I was a social worker, but it was like, how do you have a social worker leading tourism? This woman, so the condescending, this woman, this woman is useless. This woman is this. And then you ask, on what basis are you making this? You know. So I watch these things. I'm making this example to tell you that the issues of representation are very important. Until we make sure that when people are in position, because it shouldn't depend, because I would have a strong character. I can fight for myself. I'm a fighter in each one. But what happens to if it's a woman who's vulnerable, who's not able to fight for themselves? Why do they have to be made to feel inferior on the positions? And, and this is the conversation most of the time I have in the tourism sector with women, and I get the feedback to say we are literally almost like dying when we are sitting. So these are the things that we must call everybody, not only focusing on government, not only as a, yes, it's good to showcase and create model, role models for younger women, but we do need to hold the men accountable. Mm -hmm. What is it that they are doing? Why must it be a conversation by women about women? Where are the men? All right, so, Minister, respectfully, uh, I, I do beg your pardon. We literally have uh, four or three, under three minutes, just to wrap up with the other panelists as well. We really honor and appreciate you. And we thank you that even in your um, feminine authority and your gentle authority, you're able to withstand all of those that are trying to derail us from what we are trying to do here uh, and fight for gender equality and gender parity. Thank you so much. May I please request that uh, our panelists, if you can take about a minute or so in wrapping your thoughts, contact details where possible, and uh, to our viewers and our participants, the webinar recording will be made available. You can join us on Facebook. It's at ANCPBF. You're welcome to join me. It's at I am Cindy Mabi on Twitter or Cindy Mabi on social media. All, all what we're doing now is to document the participation, the objectives that is required to add on and um, uh, give more impetus to the economic recovery plan. So for that, I'm really grateful to the Progressive Business Forum and our convener, Sasha Miller. So our panelists, in no particular order, but I'll start with uh, uh, Trudy. Perhaps you might have to go very quickly if you can just give us your, your final comment. As it, Dr. Spongila, you also have somebody in the background there, in case you didn't know. They have a cheerleader. <laughs> uh, Trudy, if you'll just give us your, 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 your final or summary in, in terms of your thoughts and presentation and what needs to happen going forward. Thank you. Thank you. No, my daughter has become very famous. She's been at G20 meetings. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. I've put my contact details on the chat. It's just Trudy at presidency.gov.za. I'm very open. Uh, welcome uh, engagement and ideas and, and, and just 
um, to hear um, what, what, uh, what, what's on people's minds. Um, you know, I think at, at another time, we should also talk about how implementation in some ways is also a gendered issue where there are stereotypes, you know, um, organizations reward the talkers, the people in the forefront, uh, the people with a certain kind of presence, they call it gravitas, et cetera, et cetera. But the people who are in the engine room and who are the doers are often women. And, you know, very people would say, oh, this person has great vision, da, 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 but there's never, this person is a, you know, follow through, is a completer, um, is, is able to do that. So I think we also need to talk about those kinds of gendered norms that mean that women um, are valued for things that don't catapult them um, to the top. Um, I also take the point that's also been made about the spatial character of development, um, especially as it pertains to rural women. We've been doing a lot of work on the investment mobilization program to ensure that you know, every we go to every district and understand what is it that's going to change um, the, the investment climate and the environment for economic development at a district level so that we don't have um, these spatial uh, inequities that, that we've lived in for a long time. Uh, as has been mentioned, and I think also very well appreciated, we have a president who has really taken this on. Uh, he sees um, issues around women empowerment. He sees issues around eliminating gender-based violence as you know, the generational mission. If we sort this out, we would have an appreciably different um, society that we live in. So I think I'm very honored to work for someone who really gets it. Um, who has, um, who creates teams that empower women even within the presidency and who just wants to see this done. So I think we, we have a good foundation to work with. We um, have clear direction from the top to make this the lens through which we see the recovery. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Really, really appreciate it. So it's Trudy at the presidency or Trudy at a presidency? Your email address just at presidency.gov.za. All right, got you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think it's the culture of silence that you highlighted, the fact that even in environments that are not conducive and that can be hostile, women tend to keep quiet, let alone where we have an opportunity to truly, truly express and articulate our value. Um, and I think often that's where we, we tend to underplay um, uh, our contribution. But thanks so much. I won't be making any more remarks. We're literally out of time. So I'll quickly just ask uh, Dr. Spongile Vilagazi to uh, share her closing remarks. And thereafter, Gina Skuman, if you'll take over from here. Uh, Phoebe Porthitter thereafter, and then our convener, Sasha Miller. And then I'll just uh, be able to give you uh, contact details at the end. Dr. Vilagazi, it's over to you. Thank you so much. Um, just in closing, I'd like to appreciate the minister for sharing that experience. Um, you know, because as women, the one thing that we, 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 we sometimes don't talk about is the fact that we are all in it together. It doesn't matter what level you are at. Um, the experiences are very much similar. Um, we are often not taken as seriously as we should be taken for the positions we hold and also for the knowledge we bring to the table, which is unfortunate. And that's why that we should be framing any, any developmental plans that we're putting together. We should be framing them to say, how do we design them in such a way that um, you know, they, 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 they put women at the center, you know, women experiences, and, and, and also appreciating what comes natural um, to women. I like what, what Trudy also said about the, the, the qualities that are often looked at and celebrated um, in these environments, that when you come across as, as, as hard and tough and you know, then you are seen as you are a leader, you, are, you, are, you, you can be respected. Whereas sometimes what comes natural to women is to be cooperative and, uh, uh, and nurturing. So those qualities, we need to get to a point where they are celebrated, they are not seen as, because it's good for the economy, it's good for the country. When we have what, what we call nine paid care work, uh, you know, it's, it's seen as something that is just non-paid, something that women do, but it's actually essential for the economy. Women, somebody has to do that. So that we have to put value behind those, those kind of things. So yeah, thank you so much for this um, opportunity. And I hope that um, this is just really a start to start uh, bringing those kind of women issues to the fore. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Vilagazuchina. That's uh, your cue. Thank you. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you to everyone today. Some closing remarks from my side, and I'm going to follow on on the same thread here, is again to highlight that silver lining of, of 
woman being right in front of us and the, the, the answer to this being right in front of us is woman being a growth accelerator. And by recognizing and to carry on with that thread, that it is those invisible parts, those invisible roles that women play in an economy that are not necessarily measured in our, in our macro data, but are certainly enhancing the macro data in the end. Um, and, and, and to finish off with and, and to echo again what was just said, maternal leaders are naturally inclusive. And I think as we get more of the, the maternal side from female participation in the economy um, on the app, you will see that come through in the leadership and the inclusivity that comes with it. So thank you so much for today. Get to share your contact details. I would have done uh, this platform a disservice and especially with the Progressive Business Forum, everybody's asking, just please can we um, you know, share contact details, collaborate, have somebody to receive our proposals, etc. Yes, certainly it's on the chat and it's gina.skuman at city.com. And for some spelling there, it's G-I-N-A dot Skuman, S-C-H-O-E-M-A-N at city, which is C-I-T-I dot com. Much appreciated. Thank you so much. And it's over to you, Comrade Fidi. Thank you very much. Um, I, I just, I think that the, just as a follow on to, to the other speakers, um, it's a multifaceted approach. So we need to look at what government should be able to do. We need to look at women's networks. And when we talk about the women's networks, we're not just talking sectoral or national. We're also talking about local women's networks because that's how you, you bring in rural women, you bring in community women, the informal sector. So I think that that's very important. Third issue is the importance of advocacy and monitoring. So we need to advocate for these issues, but we must also monitor so that there's a relationship between our advocacy and, and, and what we continue to demand. Um, and then the issues about young women, I think that we need to look at how do we bring young women, women in, mentor them, whether they're professionals, whether they're students, we need to look at all of those issues. And then lastly, I completely agree that we need to look at how do we redefine gender norms and the value that we put onto the things that, that um, the roles that women play in society, the, the kind of styles of leadership that women bring, the kind of work that women do, um, because that's the only, only way that we can be able to change that thing. And then last, 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 bringing men into the conversation. You know, what we have now in the debate about gender-based violence is to call men out and say, what are you doing as men and boys to fight and end gender-based violence? Because the majority of the, of the problem in terms of the perpetuator are male. What do you do to call out your brothers, your, your, your uncles, your fathers, your friends? And I think that in this con conversation about women in the economy, we need to also call out male leadership and professionals and business leaders to ask the question, how do you mainstream gender within whatever you do? Thank you very much. Thank you for that. And ladies, there's a lot that we still need to ponder on, but um, I really take comfort in the fact that this is a working document and that all views will be considered, but we encourage participation as widely possible as people can participate. So the recordings again will be made available and whatever else that we can do in collaborating with each other and our various networks is what will give us the um, suppose the silver lining being a reality, just to steal from Gina, Gina's line there. So uh, to our convener, I mean, earlier on when we were speaking, Sasha, is that sometimes, you know, the proverbial glass ceiling is also something that is imposed by ourselves as women, where you second guess yourself. Yes, it's the patriarchal imperatives of the past that has brought us where we are. Just tell us from your personal, I suppose, desire and what you want to see uh, happen with the uh, participation of women in the economic recovery plan as brought by the uh, Progressive Business Forum. In closing, please. Thank you, Cindy. Um, thank you to all the panelists, um, but especially to our participants today. I urge you, please engage with us, send us emails. If you didn't get the contact details, use helpdesk at pbf.org.za and we will get you the information. 
on women in society, and I can talk from my own experience there, uh, even if we get the training, even if we get the opportunity perhaps to do it, um, there's a study, a global study that says 76% of women feel have suffer from imposter syndrome. What is imposter syndrome? But really that is a woman who is in a role who doesn't feel they really deserve it and that they can't really fulfill that role. And so they're always trying to prove themselves or think even when the writing is on the wall that they're clearly succeeding, that it's not happening. Now, it takes everybody to make uh, things better. So the inclusivity of things is that the confidence of women need to come more to the fore. And it's hard to get that confidence when you're looking at social norms, uh, and Phoebe, you've, you've relayed to that, of how women are being treated and how you are torn, taught from a child that you have a certain place in society. How do we work on overcoming that and breaking through it? And that's why I said in my speech at the beginning, get ready to feel uncomfortable and take those chances. And I promise you as a woman, because generally women <laughs> seem to find a way to get things done, we will make that difference together. And don't feel to the small businesswoman that you are small and you are nothing. You are and a micro businesswoman. You are very important. You are very important to the economy. Just because we're, you're not on a stat sheet or you're not being presented on the highest level doesn't mean you don't make a difference. Your difference makes a great deal. It makes a great deal to your family. It makes a great deal to your community. And that's where I want to bring in something I always bring into the webinars, which is something I like to push is Ubuntu economy. And um, we all know what the spirit of Ubuntu is, it's sharing, it's about community. But each one of us can make the difference to our own communities, our economy, if we just consciously look at supporting each other. And in particular, look at supporting small women businesses within your area. So within your street, within your WhatsApp group, within your community group, just try and take a little bit of that money that you earn, even if it's not much, uh, your supplier database within your business and try and find a way to support it. Because it's not just about a tick box approach of someone having to monitor and evaluate to make sure that gender bias, uh, gender equality is being, it's about us doing it from our heart. And honestly, if we do it from there, it's the best place to make the best change. So thank you everybody for being here today. Thank you so much, Madam Convener. Thank you indeed for this platform. You almost uh, yeah, got me it, uh, up uh, in, on my feet and singing, So so thank you very much, ladies. Really appreciate it. And again, uh, may we continue on the social media platform. It's helpdesk at pbf.org.za if you want to send questions. But uh, the platform is there for us to ventilate some of the issues that were outlined. I love what Gina was saying that there needs to be a sovereign uh, gender bond. You know, there are certain um, incentives that need to be given for the work, unpaid work that women are doing. And Trudy, thank you so much for also reiterating from a government point of view, uh, from the presidency, on highlighting the inclusion of women in the economy. Uh, Phoebe, thank you so much for your insights as well, what we can learn from uh, the rest of the continent or the rest of Africa, and Dr. Villagazi for your perspective as well. Convener, again, Seat Boma. From myself, Cindy Mavi, thank you again for this opportunity. May you multiply joy where you are and also collaborate with us on this journey of making South Africa the country that we all desire to see. I really appreciate it. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Thank you.